Hi there, everyone. Um, I'm Adrian Warnock, and uh, it's a great privilege today to welcome to um, to the internet, if you like, on to the blog, Facebook, everywhere else this is going out. Um, a good friend of mine, who's also a real expert uh, therapist and counsellor, um, Icy Butcher. Welcome, Icy. Hello, Adrian. It's lovely um, to be here. I know, it's really lovely, isn't it? Because, of course, you and I have known each other, oh my gosh, um, rather more years than I should admit to as a sort of... Uh... <laughs> yeah, a long um, time. <laughs> yeah, and uh, we've, we've been in the same church together. Hmm? Don't, say how many, don't say how many no, years. I, 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 no, I, I, I thought, it, yeah, I, I mean, it's, it's rude to sort of do that for... But let, I put it this way... Um, Put it this way, I think um, I don't. I think we met each other when either we didn't have any children at all, or very young children, didn't we? Let's put it that way. In fact, I think probably no children. Yeah. Children, yeah. <laughs> and we've both got grown-up children, so um, so it's been a while. But um, I see is um, a uh, Christian and a, a counselor and therapist, and um, I see is somewhat of an expert, I think, in handling particularly sort of difficult trauma and uh, difficulties dealing with people who've had really difficult lives. Uh, I think it's Jordan Peterson who says that life is suffering. I'm mean, not everybody realizes that, but sooner or later, I guess people hit that, don't they, at some point. And for Icy, um, we'll talk a bit, I think, about her own journey, because one of the things that, that makes her such a, a great therapist, I'm sure, not that I've obviously ever had therapy from a friend, because you don't mix boundaries that way, um, but, um, I'm sure one of the things that makes her such a great therapist and what people say about her is, is that she understands because of what she's gone through. And I think that's quite an important thing. So I'm conscious that there are different people watching as we kick off. Um, there'll probably be some uh, folks watching this, you know, who, who know me through the Blood Cancer Uncensored uh, page, and this will go over on there. And um, many people on there have a sort of chronic health condition, which totally, in some cases, can totally... Um, undo all your plans for life and I know that Icy has a chronic health condition and so we'll talk about that and so that will be of interest there um, in terms of how you cope with something that goes on I mean I'm thinking it's been three and a bit years for me but Icy how long has it been for you we'll get into the details later but it's been like what 10 years 20 years eight years going on nine years but sort of like leading up was a number of years before that yeah. so, so we're talking eight nine ten years at least of a physical health problem with real severe chronic pain isn't it and we'll talk more about that uh, in a moment but but also before that um, there was a lot of difficulties in in sort of relationships for icy growing up and things like that and difficult you know traumatic events you know that have, that have occurred that that would be enough to sort of unhinge many people and to make them lose their faith uh, yeah. or to make them you know really depressed or to make them you know, really unable to be of much use to anyone else. <laughs> you know, some people, unfortunately, it, it can be almost like something damages them. And I think there's that image sometimes in the culture that, you know, certain things happen to someone, they're damaged. Um, and that's yeah. the end of that. But that hasn't been the case for IC. And I've always been impressed with IC's cheerfulness, but also her honesty and her reality. She's never been someone who's just put on a fake Christian smile. Um, and so for the Christians out there, you know, some of you I know think that Christians are supposed to have these beautiful, clean lives that, where everything is blessed and, and wonderful and you go from floating from moments of glory to the next. Well, life isn't always like that, so I still talk about that. Um, and then I suppose critically for all of us, really, um, unfortunately, it's still the case that many people are quite reluctant to reach out for therapy. And so one of my challenges to anyone who's watching this, whether they've got a diagnosis or whether they're just suffering because of COVID, I mean, who isn't? Um, or whether they've got difficult relationships or whether they've had a bereavement recently or, or even if they've had a bereavement many years ago that they've never processed or any of these things really life sucks sometimes life is suffering and I guess sometimes therapy is what is useful for us in helping it one of the reasons it's useful is because it helps us to think about suffering and how we deal with it so I think we're going to spend some time together um, based on Icy's Christian background but also her, her, her therapy training um, and uh, no doubt, I suppose a little bit of my, my psychiatry might creep out in here and then in the conversation. Um, and um, we'll talk a bit together as, as friends, really, but also as people who've, who've been there in terms of both give, giving care to people who've been suffering. You know, certainly I spent eight years working as a psychiatrist, but also, you know, being the patient, if you like, as well. So I guess that's, you know, that's what I want to just sort of kick off. So. So I see, I guess maybe a good place to start would be for you to just give us a bit of a, a story of your life and how you ended up at the place you are now running your own sort of therapy business. 
Yeah. That's a nice open-ended I mean, question. So take about five minutes or so to explain I mean, it. What do we have? I could go on for, for ages. I, I think, you know, people call it a journey and it really is a journey. It might sound cheesy and people might cringe at, oh, stupid words like that, you know, but actually it really is, you know, and, and my journey started from childhood. You know, I, I ended up in the care system. Um, I was in long-term foster care from the age of three, um, right up until I left care at, officially at 18. Um, and I was damaged. I, you know, that word damaged, you know, when you think about it, it, it is huge. You know, lots of traumatic events during that time of childhood. And then, you know, going into adulthood, being very angry, very angry at the things that had happened to me. Um, and I ended up going into therapy for two solid years. And when I say it was full on, so I had, I always remember I had um, face to face with an individual counsellor and I had group therapy every single week for two years. Uh, that was, and I still say it was the hardest two years of my life. And, you know, I've been married over 20 years. I've got four kids. And I still say those two years were the hardest years of my life. Um, you know, but I would also say that those two years, they saved my life really saved my life you know learning to feel the emotions to sit with the emotions to process them to work out what was affecting me what was stuff that I could deal with then but what was stuff I had to be patient about um and you know my individual counselor I she was like to even to this day she's a rock star to me and she was really the reason why I was like you know what I could go into this and help other people with with coming from my own pain, but also you know general stuff going on in their lives. Yeah. So, yeah. Just tell us a little bit more because uh, you know you you mentioned the difficult childhood, and obviously I know you know I don't want to sort of ask you to share anything you're not comfortable with, but what what were the sort of main sort of headlines there that that led to that feeling of of being damaged in that way? So I was I was abused physically, emotionally, sexually. I was, um, you know, taken from uh, a couple of different homes before I ended up in my forever home, as they call it now, in the care system. Um, I was very fortunate and very blessed that I had an amazing forever family who just loved us. Um, it was de difficult, definitely. Um, but if you mix all of those types of abuse together, equals very angry, self-loathing, hatred, confidence, at zero young people, you know, and, and I was that. Right. Yeah. So I suppose you could see yourself going down a, a rather scary pathway, I suppose, as you were coming into that young adulthood. What yeah. was it that made you think I need help? Because not everyone does. A lot of young people will think I can't, I can't reach out for help. And especially sometimes people in churches think yeah. well, that's not right. You know, I'm, I'm supposed to just believe in God and everything's going to be fine. Or, or they just think, you know, they're too sort of, I don't know, um, what the word would be just like too ashamed, I suppose, to reach yeah. out for help. So, I mean, what, what was it, do you think? That, that How did that happen? Because a lot of people... Unfortunately, they don't reach out for help, do they? Yeah, they don't. And, and do you know what? It was actually my mum. My mum was, uh, so this is my foster mum, my forever mum. So I just call her mum. So if I'm talking about mum, that's who I mean. Um, yeah, so when I was 16. Um, she, she and I, I think I broke down about something. I can't remember. Hmm. But she, she just said to me, how would you feel if you had some, someone to talk to? And I was very nervous, but it was actually a lady I knew in my church. Um, and she was an older lady and I already trusted her in that sense. Um, and I went to see her, not, of, not often and not a lot, but it was enough to introduce me into the world of counselling. And, you know, at 16, you think you can take the world on, you know, you have, you have a bit of a chat, you feel a bit better and then off you go. And then when I hit 18, uh, I mean, I had got into, I was drinking a lot, I was doing drugs, I was doing all sorts. And I remember one night and I was high and I was driving and it was a really scary moment where I was actually really kind of like tripping. And at that moment, I was like, 
if I carry on with this, I will be dead in the gutter. I need to change my life. And, I, and it was at that point that I was like, right, I go for help. Mm. So I did. That's really yeah. good. That's really good. So, I mean, I think that's, that's a really interesting point that you just made there, actually, isn't it? Because I think, you know, sometimes you look at a kind of a kid who's sort of, quote, quote, going off the rails, people might use the phrase, you know, drink, mm. drugs and all the rest, risky behaviour. Yeah. And I think people just think, oh, that's just a naughty kid or something. But actually, yeah. it's probably quite often the case that there's something much deeper there. And so how, yeah. how we make sure that we don't sort of, I don't know, just react to people in a way that just, I don't know, stigmatises them or makes them feel that they're rejected by the church, they're not good enough for God or not good enough for yeah. society, even if they're not Christians. I mean, what, what, any thoughts on that? But I think all behaviour like that, destructive, Christian or not, you know, yeah. it's... It, saying there's something wrong in my world it's saying i need help and you know somebody could be doing that behavior for years and years and years and, and it is a test to see well who's going to still be there at the end of it because we push wow. people away from behave like that you know and wow. you know i i know i remember one of mine she was non-christian and she just said to me your language is disgusting i see i couldn't talk without swearing and and it was the challenge of that and but she was my friend right up until i left the my hometown you know and she stuck with me you know and it's it's i lost a lot of friends yeah but i think it's those people who just say whatever happens i will be there and i will help you and i will try my best to still be there you know through all the bad times as well as the good so it's interesting so so what you're saying if i hearing you correctly then was that you were almost deliberately pushing people away because you didn't know that they would they would be there for you that you didn't know that they would love you that they would support you i suppose is that right yeah absolutely i didn't trust anybody anybody mm. you know including my parents you know i didn't fully trust them you know, i had too much hurt and pain but um, you know, it was it was again. It's this journey of of you know you build up. I talk about evidence with my clients. You know, well, what's the evidence of feeling like that? You know, and and it can be I've been let down over and over and over again. And so then it's like, well, let's build the other evidence. What is the other evidence? Look at the other relationships in your life. You know, have they left you? No, they haven't. Okay, that evidence goes into your arsenal. And when you're feeling like everybody's left you you pull out that piece of evidence of actually no this person stayed with me you know mm. so was that was that some of the work that would be done in the therapy room that your therapist would be talking about those sorts of things with you and saying sort of challenging your thoughts is that right or? Yeah, definitely so i mean i know obviously you know cbt and stuff like that so the way that i practice is I'm officially called an integrative counsellor. And so we, we've learned, you know, um, about the theories like CBT, psychodynamic, a solution focus, that sort of thing. And we incorporate it into this beautiful, cohesive, um, you know, way of working. And I think the theory behind it is everybody's so uniquely individual that not one set theory is gonna work with maybe one person compared to the other person yeah. you know so you need to be able to read what does my client need and then it might be that session is about cbc challenging those thoughts and and replacing them with uh, um you know a new, new belief it could be looking at childhood stuff and the trauma from that it could be you know looking at you know well how do we deal with this you know specific problem right in front of us like I know I've got to sit in an exam during COVID and, you know, sitting in my front room creates lots of stress for me. Right. Solution focus. How do we work this out? How do we do that? So it really depends on the client and the client's needs and, and working with that. Yeah. So you, you mentioned a couple of sort of words uh, a little bit around this as well, around um, emotions and thoughts and behaviours. And I think we sometimes mix those things up. People talk about feelings. I think feelings are a bit of an unfortunate word because is that a thought or is that an emotion? I, I, it can be, I mean, I guess it can be both, but you know. So can you just sort of elaborate that a little bit more? So do you think that, you know, you talked about challenging thoughts. Do you think we should be challenging our feelings as well? Because I know sometimes people will say, you know, come on, pull yourself together. You should be happy. You know, you've got, you, that, one of the things I know for a lot of people that will be listening on the cancer side, you know, um, maybe you've been given a chronic cancer diagnosis and it's slow growing. And so 
So you should be happy because it's, at least you haven't got a fast growing one or something like that. And so then people sort of challenge the emotion and feel guilty for feeling sad. Um, but then also sometimes people just don't challenge their thinking. So talk a bit about that for us. What's you know, the difference? You know, one of the things I hate, I really hate, you know, when people say, oh, you know, you'll get over it. Just give, mm. it, some, give it some time. And I don't think it's about getting over it. I think it's going through it. I think, I think you have to go through it, you know, and I think you have to learn to feel the emotion and then the thoughts that go with the emotion. So, you know, you could be feeling angry. What's that anger about? Break it down. Is it about, I don't know, for instance, like what you've just said about the slow growing, you know, is it about that, you know, you're ill and you've got side effects and it's going to be very long. Is it about things being taken away from you in that moment? Or is it pure, or is it not purely, but you know, is it about I've got this diagnosis and I don't know what to do with it? You know, mm. and I and I do think that actually, yes, yeah, sometimes we need to challenge the you, you know, I've had it in my own life, you know, I have a chronic condition with my back. And you know, and I can't do the things that I used to do. Right. I, I used to clean the house top to bottom religiously two three times a week i was i was one of those people yeah if i get through the front room now every other week i'm doing amazing but to some people that's quite insignificant but to me that's me failing that's me not working hard enough you know and and many other different emotions in that but for me i had to work out well where's that sense of failure coming from and I worked out that in my family, we're hard workers. And, you know, if you're sitting down during the daytime, you're not working. So that's the voice that goes on in my head. So I've had to challenge those thoughts. And then with that, thinking, I'm not lazy, I'm in pain. So challenging the emotions. Does that make sense? Yeah. So, so, so yeah, I think I, I get what you're saying. So there's it's a sort of like battling the mind, really, I guess, almost, yeah. that you're talking about. Um, but but also perhaps sort of going a bit easier on yourself about about the emotion and actually sort of recognizing the emotion. I think you know because you, you've spoken about that about the need to be able to actually experience the emotion rather than just sort of try and pretend it's not there. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. I think one one of the hardest things to learn is I think you know first of all about facing it, you know, and 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 recognizing something is is wrong. In your world and, and then I also think it's about learning to sit with those emotions they're uncomfortable they're not nice and what we want to do is push it away push it down explain it away rather than just sit with I feel absolutely terrible or I feel so let down or I feel so angry or I feel absolutely destroyed by whatever's going on for for you and I remember when my back first went, I was flat on my back for six months. And then I started to be able to walk around a bit and muscles started to loosen, you know, and I had people saying to me, oh, just get going. It's just a back thing. You'll be all right once you get going. And I had to live with those sorts of things. I had to live with people saying, oh, we don't see you anymore. And I'm like, I can't get out. I can't even sit in a chair without seizing up in pain. And then I was like, there's something wrong with me. I'm not dealing with it properly. I'm not, and I had to begin to let go of that, sit with the uncomfortable feelings like feeling lazy or not being good enough and start realizing, actually, no, my body is doing one thing. My mind is doing another. My emotions are doing something completely different. Yeah. And trying to put it together and be okay with all areas. It's a hard journey, hard. Yeah, and I think you've, you know, you've had it harder than most. Let's be honest, uh, because we've obviously sort of bookended uh, two big things there. You know, your 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 physical health problem, which is obviously the last sort of ten years or so, and then obviously your childhood. But then in between, you know, I guess there was a period where things were going quite well. I mean, you you moved to the area, you you married a lovely guy, and yeah. you you started having a kid, and then and then something pretty drastic happened, didn't it? Yeah, so, um, how do I explain this? So there's me, my brother, and my sister's birth, birth siblings. It's very close to my sister. And 
uh, she had a son who um, at six years old, when he was six, she suddenly died. And, you know, at that point, my back was fine. Um, you know, I had two birth children myself and um, I got a phone call to say that she, she had died. And at that moment in time, we didn't know how. There was a police investigation into it because she was, she was 26, um, you know, and you know, it turns out that the police think that her drink was spiked and she had this massive reaction and, and heart, heart, heart failure and died. Mm. So yeah. you were a young mum, you yeah. know, having had this horrendous journey that you'd somehow overcome and, you know, had, had started a family and then, you know, that, that sister that you were obviously so close to just disappeared. I mean, that, that must have been a huge sense of loss for you. Yeah, definitely. I think, you know, loss and bereavement is so misunderstood um, in our society. You know, again, we're told with time you'll get over it. You never get over it. You have to go through it. You have to feel it. You have to recognize that, you know, I, I, I am mid forties and I lost my dad when I was um, eight years old. Um, he died of heart attack suddenly at uh, my birth dad, this is, and, um, you know, is I still cry and grieve over him now. Does it affect my daily life? No. You know, with time, I've learned how to manage that and how to sit with that. Um, and the same with my sister. You know, with my sister, you know, she was my best friend next to my husband. And, and that grief, you know, unless you've been there, it's very hard to explain the depth that it goes to, you know? Mm. Yeah, I, I, it's, it's an interesting thing, isn't it? Because I think some people don't understand the suffering that others have, whether it's through grief or whether it's through, you know, chronic suffering, sick, mm. sickness, pain, you know, diagnosis or, you know, sort of upbringing issues, obviously, you've spoken to. And it, I guess if yeah. you've never touched that, then I think some people go through life, but I don't know, maybe they don't, but I get this feeling anyway. And I, I think to a certain extent I was like this until a few years ago where you go through life and really everything seems to be sort of going okay and, and then suddenly it isn't <laughs> and, and that can be a real shock for the system I think for some people we almost don't expect it do we and, and then how yeah. do you handle that I mean what sort of tips would you have if someone came to you as a therapist and I don't know that something something big has just happened whether yeah. it's a new diagnosis or you know loss or how would yeah. you help the, your clients through that I always remember I had um, I had one specific client who had just had like, a life changing experience, and she came to me and she she just cried and cried, mm. cried. I think for the first five sessions, mm. and and it's about getting in the dirt with that person in the mud, as it's called, you know, and and just sitting with that person, and it's. You know, who do you have in your life who, who won't tell you what to feel, who won't tell you what to do, won't try and give you helpful advice, but who can just sit with you as you feel it, you know? And who do you have in your life that after a few months of doing that or needing that, who will just say, right, do you want to go for a coffee? Or, you know, to gently lead you to do something else you know, to gently challenge you, but not in a way of you should, you must, mm. you know? Yeah. It's looking at that support system. And if you don't have a support system, many people don't, you know, it's looking at, right, who do what, who, what do I need to do? I need to actually talk this out with someone, you know, and finding a therapist that you can do it with. Yeah, no, that's right. And, and I guess it's not an either or thing, is it? I mean, you, you sort of, talked already about the fact that you've had some people in your life that were supporting you over the years uh, when you were sort of receiving more than giving if you like the therapy um, and um, but your therapist that works alongside that I think sometimes people think well I've got friends so I don't need a therapist yeah. um, but that's not necessarily the case is it no it's not I think therapists just bring something very different you know they're they're neutral you know and and that and that therapist is there for you no motives apart from I just want to help you and see you through this traumatic experience in your mm. life you know and if a therapist is saying well I think 
you should do this, then I would head for the door. <laughs> yes, quite. Yeah. <laughs> no, yeah. And about, that's it's an interesting point, isn't it? Yeah, go ahead, sorry. No, I was just about to say, you know, it's, it's about the client. It's always about the client and the client's needs. You know, um, the way that I work, I don't do diagnosis. But I will work with the diagnosis that if they've had one, that they will come to me and we'll work out what does that mean for you? You know, what does that mean in terms of practical stuff, as in emotional stuff, as in relationship stuff? You know, it, it can affect everything. Yeah, no, sure. Absolutely can. I, I, I often say, you know, that these things can be like a tsunami that come in and just sweep everything away. Sometimes it feels like there's just wreckage everywhere. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Definitely. Yeah. Definitely. Um, and that's kind of normal. And I think sometimes people feel like they're the only one. They sort of, they feel like everyone else must be coping with this much better than I am. You know, there's just something, something bad about me that means that I can't cope when other people can. Yeah. Or maybe other people are just better at hiding it. Do you think? I think so I think we we learn how to hide things very well, but I think that we can only do that for so long before it starts to bubble out. And like if you think like a volcano, it's all down there, and then at some point it's going to erupt, you know. And and I think particularly when people end up get you know going for therapy, what they're doing is they're phoning in a crisis, whereas they should have been coming when it was all bubbling rather than spewing out. I mm. always remember. Um, when I was, I, I was married and it was before children. And I had someone, um, we, I was walking up the street with a group of friends and someone sidled up to me and just said, oh, your life is just so perfect. You know, I don't think you quite realize what you've got. So to you? Or, yeah, oh. to me, it was like, oh. she didn't know my story or anything, but she made no. this, she made the assumption that I had a marriage I had a house, I had a car, you know, all yeah. those material things, but also the, the emotional things. I was happy and I was settled. And she made the assumption. How many assumptions are made about people living with in chronic pain, walking down the street? If I, if I can walk to the shops and back, yes, I've done a great day without my walking stick, that is, you know. That's, mm -hmm. that's good for me, you know. And, and people are different if I walk with my walking stick. Much more, oh yeah, but you know, people make assumptions. Oh, you know, she's walking, she's fine. Or, mm. you know, she's at church every week, she's fine. Or, yeah. you know, she, she's working hard, you know, that's why we haven't seen her, but she's all right, she's told us. When, when actually behind closed doors, that person's in the corner crying every night mm. under mm. their bed sheet because they've got so much depression, they don't know how to how to even come out of the covers, you know? Mm. Yeah, sure. And, I mean, it's, 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 sorry, go ahead. What's no, that? I feel like I keep going off on tangents. I get very passionate mm. about this. No, it, it's, this is exactly what I, what I was wanting. It's just, um, it's very, very helpful. I suppose I'm just sort of thinking about that, you know, the, the, the relentless of it, of it is one of the things, isn't it? It's like kind of, I think one of the things that you know very well from this sort of last 10 years is just that sort of relentlessness and the sort of and, and and just the sort of I guess the way other people are you've begun to touch on that about how it can be quite hard because you feel a bit sort of cut off from other people and that they don't understand and yeah. maybe they say unhelpful things in a church context or just in general life it can be really difficult you feel more distant from your friends and things and even family I mean do you know how did you cope with that for these last 10 years I think it's been it's been really hard I'll, I'll be honest you know really hard because it's not just coping with you know when it first when my first when I first had my back issues you know it was almost having to convince people of how bad it was you know that's what I think mm. I felt I was doing for the first few years and then it was almost like... So people existed. were saying, oh, it's all right, it's all right, you're not as bad as all that, it's just a sore back kind of thing, yeah. Yeah, exactly. And, 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 and then, I guess, you know, it'll be better, have faith, you know, just pray, everything will be all right. Yeah, yeah, the faith thing is a very hard thing to manage with chronic stuff going on in your life, you know, because you, you know, you go for prayer and you're not healed and people are like looking at you and, you, you know, you hear preachers about, you know, is it sin in your life or is it that? Listen, I... I sat there in these meetings thinking 
you know, uh, I've repented, I've done this, I've done that, and yet I'm still not healed. And then you hear the preachers about, you know, your time will come, your time will come. You're like, you know what? I think I've got to the stage of absolutely believing I can be healed, you know, spiritually. But at the same time, right now, in the here and now, I can't live with, with the potential of being healed in my head because otherwise I'll do nothing and I won't challenge myself and I won't get going in that sense. I will completely give up. But at the same time, it's holding the fact that I believe God can heal me. But at the same time, he's also given medical doctors the ability to help diagnose medicines and stuff like that. And you need to use those, you know? Mm. And, and I mean, hope is a really difficult thing, isn't it? Because, I like, I guess what people are trying to do sometimes, is, I think we should give them the benefit of the doubt. They're trying to give you hope, aren't they? They're saying, yeah. it's going to be fine, don't worry. But yeah. sometimes if you get your hope up too much, it can almost, I mean, the Bible says hope deferred makes the heart sick, doesn't it? Yeah, absolutely. You know what, Adrian? I remember going to a, a meeting and... Um, my back was sore. I was I wasn't in a great place like physically, but I went because it was a healing meeting, and um, I did a whole day, and I wasn't healed. I went home. It took me about three weeks emotionally to get over that, mm. and I I I just struggled because it what again it wasn't me. Again, you start looking at what's wrong with me. What have I done? Mm rather than thinking okay you know what it wasn't you know i have to now deal with this hope that has been gone uh, snatched away again because it is like that isn't it mm. i don't know about you but you yeah. know say so hope is that's a hard one to manage and and navigate you know yeah yeah because you want to have hope but you don't want to be unrealistic at the same time because it's otherwise you just come down in into despair don't you so build yourself up and i, I mean yeah. you know it might be a, the, 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 ne the next treatment i mean i know for you you've had sort of all kinds of fancy treatments and you must sort of think well you wouldn't be doing it if you weren't hoping it was going to help but yeah. i guess sometimes you go in thinking oh i'll be fine after this and then maybe it's a bit better but not as much better as you wanted and then are you disappointed that you didn't get all of what you want or are you grateful for, the, for getting what you did i i, I don't know Oh, it's really hard, isn't it? I think I think one of the things I've learned to do is manage expectations now. Right. So at the beginning, my expectations were really high. This is going to be the one, you know. Again, like you said, I've been through a number of back procedures. Uh, this one's going to be the one. This one's going to last longer. You know, this one's going to give me freedom, and then it gives me nothing, or it gives me a small amount of, of freedom physically. And, and I think I, what I had to do was adjust my own expectations, you know, of this could really help, but it might not. And I had to go in with that every time. And in fact, the last procedure I had, I probably had less high expectations about, and it's helped me the most, you know. That's and interesting. Yeah, it's very interesting. I don't know what that's about, you know, it'd be interesting. Um, but you know i definitely again it's that journey of working out where where do i need to put my expectation level in a healthy way you know because i think if you're too low you're you're being very negative but if you're too high you know it you know it could end in like despair like you say and mm. you know you don't want to get to that point i've been to that point you've been to that point it's, it's, yeah it's the hard. stopping into the pillow point isn't it really at night you know Yes, it's, exactly. it's, it's, it's the three o'clock in the morning everyone else is asleep in the house but you're crying into the pillow i bet you've been there am i right i, I mean, we've not spoken about that but have you been there yeah yeah and and not just one night multiple nights row after <laughs> yeah. row and you're exhausted and then you're struggling even more physically yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. no exactly it's exactly it's, and, and just that feeling of being alone i mean that's the other thing isn't it of, of yeah. that nobody understands you know that can be a a, a real trap i think for people um to, to fall into because in a sense nobody does understand because nobody can walk your journey with you as much as they might try yeah i think you know you, you know if you pick up like the the therapy thread about walking in someone else's shoes that's a really hard skill to do but people can do it even if they haven't had chronic pain you do find those amazing people who just get get what you're saying and take your word for it you know uh, i think one of my 
most wonderful moments was actually with you, Adrian. And, you know, I think we came to you for dinner and, and you and I just started talking and it was like both of us going, yes, that's how I feel, yes, you know, and it was that moment. Yeah, our, our poor husband and wife were sort of sitting there not knowing quite what to say, were they? But yeah, they were there. <laughs> yeah, you and I were just completely, you know, like, taking over the whole conversation. But, you know, it was that, there was a that was, release. That was a while ago, wasn't it? Yeah, it was. It was a releasing moment. And so it's like, you know, I wonder, you know, I found a few people who I've managed to, you know, who've come into my friendship circle who who walk in my who walk in my shoes or try to and who are going through chronic stuff. And so we just connect on that level. Um, you know, it's a wonderful thing when when you can do that, which is, you know, even support groups, you know, online, things like that. They're, they're important because it's people with similar experiences. No one can have exactly the same experience. Um, yeah. You know, connecting and, and offloading and finding out more and saying, I've just had a night in my pillow, yeah. you know? Yeah, yeah. And I guess, I mean, I don't know, maybe as well, not every friend that you have or every family member has to have the same amount of understanding, do they? I think it's sometimes... I, it's sometimes tempting to just, as well, going back to what you were saying about you as a teenager, to push people away if you think they don't understand or not want to be with people if they say unhelpful things, if people do say unhelpful things. Um, but I guess, like, again, maybe there's expectation management with some people that you just have to realise that there are some people that they're just not going to be able to get it in the same way. But that doesn't mean you can't have a coffee with them and talk about your kids. And sometimes it's nice not to talk about the problems, isn't it? Yeah, oh, it's lovely, isn't it, sometimes? It's like when you've got little kids, you know, and you find those friends who don't want to talk about kids, you're like, yes! <laughs> you know, <laughs> yeah. like, it's really nice, because it's like, I can be an adult and talk about other things. And I think it's the same with chronic stuff, because you're, uh, you know, I know my mind is constantly filled with, okay, if I sit in this position for too much longer, I'm going to have to, you know, I'm going to feel it tomorrow, you know, and so my head's constantly churning. So to have someone not talk about it it's actually quite nice but you're right as well there are people who are friends or family loved ones who just won't get it and again we have to accept that that's where they're at it's frustrating for us and it's unfair as well because we really are feeling this stuff um but they're not there yet doesn't mean you don't have to be friends doesn't mean that you have to push them out of your family but it might mean that you have to adjust your boundaries on how you communicate and how much you communicate yeah no you're right i mean it's even something as basic isn't it as when someone asks you how you are i mean that was for me initially at the church i found that really really difficult because obviously you know for me it was the cancer diagnosis and everyone especially at the beginning so oh you know and um yeah. And then, of course, they don't get it because they sort of assume it's you're either going to die or get better. And so it sort of drops off. But nonetheless, people will come up to you and they say, how are you? You know, and of course, most of the time, actually, we just say fine. But here's yeah. the thing. I don't feel like saying that because I'm not fine. I feel like that would be a lie. So then you have this kind of whole thing of, you know, how much do you share? And you yeah. maybe you overshare or you undershare. Or, and I guess for me, I've, I've, I've had to learn, you know, and I'm not sure I've always got this right you know, who it is that you really should be sharing with and who you shouldn't. And so there are some people who actually, it's almost like you'd like that friendship to be a sort of, you know, um, a problem-free zone. You know, we're just going to sit and we're going to just chat about a day or we're going to talk about, you know, yeah. those parts of our life that do feel normal, <laughs> um, whatever they are. Um, yeah. or, you know, go and do something with someone or, you know, watch a movie with them or all of these things that are normal life things to do. But then I think it is important to have, really quite deliberately and maybe not everyone does this to actually quite deliberately think right who are the people that i can be transparent with you know yeah. and it might be one or two friends you know it might be only one friend it might be one family member but not the other you know and it might be a therapist or it might be a pastor or it might be you know a, a, um, you know somebody a nurse that's looking after you or something and, and you'll find that i mean like it, it's really interesting that t people seem to differ hugely in the level of compassion that they have if you like and the level that of it's not just compassion but the ability to connect and understand and and yeah. so then don't bash your head against the brick wall like i've done with a few people and think yeah. no you've got to understand you've got to understand you've got to understand no just 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 put that yeah. person into that group of, yeah yeah that's not someone i talk to about this you know yeah, yeah definitely I, I don't know
Yeah. No. Is, that, is that how you've done it as well? I think it's brilliant, you know, that because that's that's been the same sort of journey I've had to have, you know, of, you know, actually it's not me, it is actually them, you know, and recognizing not everything is your fault, not, ev you know, taking responsibility for other people's behavior, stop doing it, you know, because it is about them and where they're at, what they can contain, what they can hold, you know, and it's about us finding those people who, you know, like you say, have it, we have to have someone we can talk to. We have to, it's really important. Um, and then the outer circle friends, you know, who know enough, but you know, don't need to know everything. And then the acquaintances that you meet up every now and again for a drink and, you know, just have a laugh, you know? I think exactly. you know, yeah. level is important, yeah. Yeah, and I guess if someone is starting to think, oh, you know, maybe I do need a therapist. Um, some, it, it, you, you can actually dip your toes in a little bit, can't you? And get a feel of how it might be because and you might, for example, um, ex you know, maybe you've never really spoken to someone at all. So, you know, maybe there's a helpline you can ring, like some of the charities will have a helpline. Well, it's not really counselling, it's not really therapy, but they offer a supportive thing. Yeah. And you can talk to someone for half an hour. And if at the end of that half an hour you think, well, that was a mess, I never want to do that again. There's no expectation that you're going to ring them back because it was just that moment. But that can be really helpful. And obviously in real crisis, you've got things like the Samaritans in the middle of the night that people could ring and all of those sorts of things. And I guess if you've done that a little bit, or maybe you've gone to one of these online forums and tried sort of typing something into a forum about how you're feeling and see the response you get, and you sort of think, actually, maybe I could open up to someone, that's then when you could perhaps think, okay, I'm going to reach out um, to therapy. Because in a sense, that's all it is, especially at the beginning. It's not going to do some voodoo on you. It's not like kind of, is it? I mean, most of the time you just walk into the room and they're going to just like, they're going to be led by you. They're going to be... Yeah they're going to be just talking really i mean initially it's just talking isn't it yeah yeah i mean the way i work it is talking therapy you know each therapist will work slightly differently because we're all different personalities and so you know but the fundamentals are you know it's about that client coming to talk about their stuff um you know and you know i know for me you know i you know i've got a, a room which i'm sitting in right now you know, and I make it as comfortable and as cosy as possible, you know, and, and as, you know, quiet and it is confidential, you know, and it is that space. And, you know, reaching out to a counsellor, most counsellors, not all, but, you know, I, the way I work is I offer, uh, you know, uh, a session, comfort, a session, you know, and, and see how you feel by the end of it. There's no pressure to make a decision there and then. You know, you might get halfway through with a counsellor, and I've done this, and be thinking, oh, I'm never coming back to this place ever again, and literally running out the door, because I didn't connect with them, they didn't get what I was saying, and it wasn't them, it was just, you know, there was something there that just didn't work for me, you know, and, um, you know, because I had to have therapy again when I went into training to be a counsellor, you know, and I remember meeting my counsellor, and she she was just lovely you know and i just sat down in her chair and she just was so gentle with me and so kind and i always remember that just her gentleness and she she listened but what she also did was she laughed with me at, at things you know and there are some things that you just cannot help laughing about you know <laughs> and i think it's important you laugh you can have a joke as well obviously is serious stuff but you know sometimes you know you know it's it's that relationship isn't it you're building relationship to be able to go deeper you know so yeah so i mean obviously at the moment with covid and lockdown and all the rest of it um there's been long periods of time and you know it's not been possible to do face-to-face -face counseling I, I know you've done a bit of sort of online how, how does that work because you you potentially you could I suppose you could counsel anyone from anywhere in the UK online, is that right? Yeah, yeah, definitely. And and I do, I've got people from all over. And it is as simply as, you know, being able to use Skype or Zoom and, you know, initial contact through phone, have a chat with me and most counsellors I know, and set a time and a date. And then um, what I usually do is 10 minutes before the session, send a text, are you ready in 10 minutes? That's like a, a countdown for them get your cup of tea or whatever and and then we start the the session and and that's it you know simple mm. as that it really is and does it work as well i mean do you think does it work as well as the face-to-face -face or 
I think it, you know, I think some people much prefer face to face and that's fine. But I think in this climate, I think, you know, what is forced people to do is to get comfortable with it. Yeah. <laughs> you know, we've had no other choice. And actually, I've had some clients really resistant, but actually they thought, you know what, I'll give it a go. And they've actually grown into really loving it because they can sit in their own comfortable place. They feel safe in the place. For some, it's not like that. You know, some yeah. people at home is not a safe place. But, um, you know, it has worked. Um, and, you know, I wonder when things settle down a bit more, how much of my work will continue to be online. It'll be well, interesting. it's an interesting point. Yeah, it's an interesting point because, of course, you know, you're quite a specialist in a way. You know, there aren't too many people that can come in with the sort of the breadth of personal experience you've had, you know, both of significant bereavement and obviously your childhood experiences and having had a sort of chronic, uh, long-standing condition and coming in you know with with a I would argue a pretty strong you know faith and a strong belief in God and a strong sort of theological background really you know you've, you've been very blessed to grow up in a you know pretty solid biblical church haven't haven't we both of us in, in the last how many years so that gives you an incredibly strong um, sort of offering so you know, for someone who might be struggling to find a local counsellor, they might look at someone like you, or it might be someone else, but the, the pattern, I guess what I'm trying to say, they can find the ideal person for them, no matter where they are in the country. It doesn't necessarily have to be determined on who, who is nearby then, does it? Absolutely, absolutely. And especially with the way it's working now, you know, I think it's made it more accessible for, for all people. And yeah. I, think that's, I think that's a good thing. Yeah, and, and I guess as well, um, for people who are too sort of sick, um, for whatever reason to go out, maybe because of fatigue or energy levels, or maybe because of pain, uh, or maybe just emotionally, it can be very difficult sometimes for some people to, to actually take that step to go out into a stranger's environment. And at least, um, you know, now in, in, it was actually probably quite hard to get good quality yeah. online counselling before, I think, because most people, you know, assumed that it had to be face to face. So I think you've got the choice, haven't you, I guess, is moving forwards. And, I suppose that would be a good place to sort of almost come to the end. The last thing I just wanted to ask you about was a little bit about faith. And I know for you, I mean, you didn't lose your faith. Many people do. Faith can be a real challenge for people when these things happen. How important do you think it is for someone to always be matched to the faith of their counsellor, either whether they've got one or not? I mean, I'm sure you see people who are Christians who are not. Um, do you think it matters or not really? No, I don't. Honestly, I really don't. I think that, you know, I think... I think I know when I, my counsellor, when I was training, she wasn't a Christian, but she was the right person for me. She really was. There was a couple of things she said that I went away and thought, mm, not sure if that kind of weighs up with my faith in that sense. And that's okay. You know, I think sometimes I know people have come to me because I'm a Christian. Um, and the one thing that they're scared about is being judged because I am a Christian. And, you know, I just said, listen, you do what you need to do in this room, you know, and, 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 we'll, and we'll deal with it and we'll talk about it, you know. Um, mm. So I think it's where you're at in your Christian walk and what you want, you know. Mm. Um, but I, I think for some people, going to non-Christian is actually probably more helpful sometimes. I'm not advocating yeah. for that in that sense. It's, just, it, it's, it's what works, isn't it, for that person. I think, yeah. But I think it's interesting because this business about, you know, feeling judged uh, or also feeling maybe a bit distant from God you know you it might be the last thing you want to talk about in that moment you know God you might be wanting to talk about other things but but also at the same time maybe some and so I suppose you can mix and match or maybe you see a pastor a, a bit every now and then but you see a, a counsellor regularly but I guess um I was just a little bit intrigued and I think it's worth maybe just highlighting this this issue of being feeling judged because I think we haven't touched on that much but it's a big deal for many Christians who are facing challenges in their life that they feel like other people are judging them why, why do you think that is i think you know for, for some you know you know feeling judged is that your faith is weaker than or you're not good enough or you're not doing it the right way and actually if we really looked at what jesus was about it was about acceptance and love and that's where we should be at, you know, and, and some of that is in us. We have to deal with that, that I am good enough. You know, I am made the way I am made. Yes, there are areas that I need to work on, but we're all work in progress. And, and people who judge, who really do judge, 
that's not for us to deal with you know that's them and it's learning to put them in a box and leaving them over there you know <laughs> if that makes sense you know yes. <laughs> we waste so much of our time and energy worrying about these other people and i'm just yeah. like, like you know when you hear those the preachers talking about you know focusing on your own race you know don't look over there don't look over there because otherwise you'll sweat you know i think that's true as well you know i think i think it's it's about you know recognizing that we are good enough 